it's 2020 and for some reason now everything is a feed endless scrolling content did anyone ask for this because this shit is definitely bad for you you're having a good day man here's something to make you angry you just wanted to read the headlines nah here's a topic you want to go down a rabbit hole on and spend until 1 a.m researching but you can't just not check the news or your feeds or you're gonna miss something anyway i can't remember how i found it but i started going back to this digest news format with a newsletter called the morning brew this is not sponsored by the way but i guess it's a bit of free advertising for them but it's kind of nice because i just get a few headlines every day in my email and it's a summary i can read and then i'm done which is such a simple and a nice idea in the era of endless feeds so i thought it would be cool if with code of course there was a way to make a customized version of this kind of like a virtual assistant that can find things just related to what you want to read and then send it to your inbox what i mean is that i wanted to make a bot that filters feeds and it sends links to me so i'm not out there in the trenches of reddit or whatever news site i want to read for example if i'm interested in the topics of remote work javascript and the company tesla because i bought some stock then i could get a digest only related to these things where my bot pulls these terms out of a feed and then sends me headlines related to those two things that way i'm both not missing anything and i don't get sucked into a random topic that i actually don't have more than a cursory interest in. To make this work, we need a few different pieces. We need a source, so that could be any news site, and we have to assess whether that source requires JavaScript. Oftentimes, the markup or HTML on your page won't load unless JavaScript runs to generate that markup if that makes sense so if you do need javascript you need a headless browser like puppeteer in javascript or selenium in python but if you don't you can just send a simple get request and the url will return the markup now the standard is requiring javascript on most pages around the internet even for simple sites like reddit because these sites don't necessarily want you scraping them so they try to make it harder but I think the real reason is for advertising stuff they want to track their users all that kind of stuff so they don't they don't allow browsing unless JavaScript is enabled anyway I have a lot of scraping videos about headless browsing so you could do that here uh, but what I've chosen to use is a simple news site that is newsycombinator.com which I do probably read the most out of any new site it's just a really simple feed it's like reddit with i don't know less negative people and more i think just better content but people people are still uh just very no bs here so that'll be our source and what we want to do is this will give us a bunch of markups so we want to run this through a parser that will just allow us to navigate through this plain text and do things like loop search and um, pull out elements by class name for example okay from the parser we want to send this to some kind of a storage <clears throat> I said that weird <laughs> storage from the parser so I like to keep it as simple as possible maybe what we want to do is just use something like redis which is an object database and uh keep things in there until we're ready to send out the email digest and from the storage we'll do the email so four distinct steps i just recorded the whole thing and my head was like blocking a big part of the code so I'm redoing it. Anyway, into the code. Oh, 
All right. Number one, source. Get in the markup from page. That's actually done just with this line. The request library just allows us to make a get request similar to when you type a URL in the browser. This is what that returns. So this is just going to return a request object. And then from that, you can extract the text. So if I run this thing with uh, interactive shell, then you can actually see that in action. So if I just start the scraper, save it in a variable, and then print the markup. This is the HTML from our whole page here. And uh, if I search for the headline magic leap, see that our our headlines are within a uh, link class. I mean, a link element. So that'll be the next thing we do. This one is done. And uh, now we'll do the parsing part. And for that, we're going to use a library called Beautiful Soup. So here's the request docs if you want to read more about that. But uh, now I'm going to code this part out. We hit the halfway point on the parsing. What I did was just use the beautiful soup parsing library, pass in the markup we got on this step into an HTML parser, which gives us the ability to do things like search it, loop through elements, that kind of thing. And that's exactly what I'm doing here with this find all method. I'm finding all the links with the class story link. And I know that that's our headline because I uh, inspected the HTML like this in Chrome. And uh, it gave me the link and the class is story link. So I'm just pulling out all those class items. So that'll give us all links, all 30 of these. And remember, we want to filter down based on a set of keywords that we're looking for. So maybe we pass those in when we actually create our class um, and then search these link headlines for the keywords if that makes sense so i'm just going to write out this next part where we filter down the links into the links containing the keywords we want All right, added a couple of things here. First, the keywords argument that we can pass in when we create our um, scraper. So just do something like scraper. And then um, let's say we put a keyword alert on database. Database. So if we do that, it'll be in the self keywords argument. Then the code I added down here created a list for saved links. So these are the only the ones we want to keep. And we're iterating through all our links that we got up here. So all 30 on the front page. Okay. So that's the outer loop, inner loop. We're looking at each keyword. In this case, we only have one. And um, we're seeing if the keyword is in the link.txt. So the thing is the link itself is a full HTML element. So it'll It'll be inside an A tag with a class and all that other stuff. We don't want to search through all that. We only want to look at the link text. So if the keyword's in the link text, nice and semantic syntax right there, uh, then we want to append the entire link, including HTML, into saved links, which is our list here. So that's how we're going to parse uh, right here, load it into the parser, and then filter down that list of links based on our list of keywords. So hopefully that makes sense. I thought the double loop syntax was most clear, but there are obviously more Pythonic ways to do this. So that being said, uh, our parser is done. Let's move on to storage. 
And for the storage, I've I thought it would be best to use a simple key value store, also known as an object database or a NoSQL database like Redis. You can really use anything, MongoDB, uh, Firestore, whatever. But Redis is nice because it's really simple, easy to set up if you don't already have it. And um, there's just two steps to it. You have to install Redis on your computer. So if you have a Mac, you can do, uh, you need homebrew, you can do brew services, install Redis. This is not a Redis tutorial, but you can look up the Redis docs and uh, figure that one out. Like right there, documentation Redis. So you need Redis and the way you test if you have it is you do Redis dash CLI, that's the path command. Um, and if that opens a, a terminal like this that gives you a command prompt, then you have Redis. Otherwise, you need to install it. And the other step is to do the Redis Python client. So Redis Python, um, this is the next thing you need to pip install. So we installed first requests, then beautiful soup four, uh, and then third, you need to install Redis. So you can just install that in whatever context you're working in. So here I'm in a virtual environment. You can install it uh, system wide. It's up to you. Pip install Redis. I already have it in this. Um, and then next thing you need to do is just import, import Redis. I think let's just make sure just take all this getting started code and uh, put that in there and uh, this is our connection that we create so let's do that in a store function self and this is just the default port so that should work uh, out of the box in most cases and we're gonna need this set function so what the set function does, just think of it like a Python dictionary. The key is foo, the value is bar. So it's the same thing as this foo bar, but you're just storing it in persistent storage or a database. So even when this Python program closes, after we scrape, we will still have the data for later when we want to send out the email. Now we want to do this scrape every hour, every two hours. Um, let's just say every hour because these article headlines, they come and go. So these articles here are going to be completely different than a few hours from now. And we don't want to miss any articles that have our keyword in them. So we're going to want to do the Redis scrape and store. So all these three lines, parse and store and whatever, um, every hour. But then we only want to email out our digest once a day. My point is this, if we're going to be scraping multiple times, then we want to be doing that in a way that makes sense. And we also don't want to be adding duplicates because if something's really popular, maybe it stays on the front page for multiple hours. So I think the best way to do that is to make the article title the key. If this whole thing with magic leap, if that's our key, a very long string, then if we try to add this same article, it's just going to, um, it won't create a duplicate. You, you can also think of this as a hash set. If you're familiar with data structures, if not, check out my course, <laughs> my algorithms course, link in description, but the key is going to be this string, right? And then the value can be our entire HTML string. So let's just, um, let me show you what I mean. This will make more sense if I do for link in saved links. And then for each one, we set in Redis uh, key link text value link. And this is all the code we need to, to store everything. So this is going to create a Redis key for every unique article that we have that matches our keyword. So I realize we haven't uh, we haven't tested this or this. So let's do both of those now, even though they're technically both done. Uh, I'm pretty confident they're going to work, though. And if not, I'll just cut the video anyway. So you'll, you'll never know. <laughs> okay. Um, let's just do an interactive shell. Python I main. And let's do, let's do this. Save it in a variable S and uh, do S dot parse. Hopefully there's no errors. Now we can check saved links. Okay, great. We have one. No, we have two. We actually have two uh, links there. 
that contain the word database. One, two. Cool. Now let's just test s.store. And uh, it didn't work. It didn't work. But that's because we have to do, uh, we have to convert this link to a string. That's it. So we can do again s scraper database s parse then s store now if we were to look directly in our redis with redis cli then it would be in there and instead of doing that let's just do our email let's just do our fourth step skip right to that so storage is done let's start creating the email function and again this is only going to run once a day so to do that, we're going to need a few things. We're going to need a Python mailer. We're going to need a Gmail account that if you're actually going to do this for yourself, you might want to make a new one just for this. And I know that sounds like a pain. It kind of is, but it'll remit. It'll leave your original email secure. So it won't get hacked basically because if you open it up to unsecure apps, which is what this is, then your security settings have to be relaxed and so on. So just be careful. That's your word of warning. Disclaimer for this course, I'm not responsible for your for your email security. Just putting that out there. Email. Um, first thing we're going to do is take out all our keys and values from Redis. So get all keys and values Redis Python. So keys, our keys. So let's just do another Redis connection for email. Uh, you could also store that on the class object if you want to. And let's do this. Let's do this. Print. So I might have some other stuff in there actually, um, which I'm going to remove if I do. Oops. I don't know why I have to. I haven't updated this like just put this in here okay there we have all our keys we have our two keys and we have a third key that we don't actually want but that's a great start some pythonic shit right here our get k4 k in our keys Now, this is going to be our links, and if this works, I'm going to be feeling like a Python god, but I don't think it will on the first try. But that's a little list comprehension for each, each K in our keys. Uh, we just tested that down here. I'm going to do redis.get that key, so that should return my value and put it in this list output uh, that's going to contain all my links. So let's see if this works. And it did work. It did work. We have our links. We've pulled them out. We actually want to send this email now. So after we do that, we're also going to want to clear all our keys and values from Redis. So clear. <clears throat> so this will be email and then we can flush flush D B that is clearing out our whole, um, our whole Redis cache so to speak. Okay. Email. Uh, this is where we need our new Gmail account. So I'm just going to take care of that and then I'll walk you through it because I'm not exact. I don't remember exactly how to do it. So I'm going to do it and then I will explain it. All right. Didn't take too long. Uh, I found a really good article and I think the reason I don't remember how to do this is because it's just a ton of boilerplate arbitrary stuff that you just kind of have to memorize uh if you do it a lot but there's no really reason to do that so uh, i found this really good stack overflow answer that's just basically all the boilerplate you need to send an email with html and python through gmail the two ways to do it through gmail are if you have a two-factor authenticated account or something you want to keep more secure you need an application specific password not too hard to do but i also don't uh i just don't want to mess with my main email so i created a new email and I called it digesterbot. 
at gmail.com. Uh, then I basically just pasted all this Stack Overflow code in to, and I roughly understand what it does. Um, you're importing SMTP lib, which is a Python library that allows you to send messages through the SMTP mail server. And you also have to define what kind of content you're sending in this email. So all you do is you create a MIME multi-part object uh, with the MIME multi-part class imported here. And then you just attach all your metadata to that. In the example, they do a text and an, a plain text and an HTML uh, version, just in case, because different emails mm, are able to receive different types of content. But since I'm only sending it to myself, I just put the HTML version in. And I did a little bit of um, string replacement with the percentage sign syntax. If you're not aware of this, it just replaces the percent %s with the arguments you pass in here. And what I did was I, I passed in the um, length of the links that I pulled out of Redis. So let's say like two links you might find interesting today. And then all the links themselves separated by some new line characters. So after a bit of trial and error, again, it came out as this. Two links you might find interesting today and you can click right on the link and it'll take you directly to the article instead of you know through hacker news with all the comments all the distractions and again this is delivered to you so that's pretty cool and then all this stuff is just you know smtp lib stuff like configuration setup you log in to your account that's why this app is not secure because you're logging directly into it and then you actually send mail so this is just the api of the smtp lib object and this won't change much from implementation to implementation. And that's why I feel okay copy and pasting it. So I'll put this Stack Overflow article in the description. I definitely want to give this guy credit for his good answer. You know, in certain cases, it's okay to copy and paste as long as you do understand what's going on. If we wanted to do this just once a day, we could just run all our methods in sequence. But instead of running s.email every time, we could only do it on a specific hour. So I think the best way to do that would be daytime get hour. So our cache will just fill up over a 24 hour time period. And then um, only if it's the hour that we want to send it out at, um, will the email part actually be sent and our cache be cleared, if that makes sense. So I'm going to do that just by importing daytime and then doing this dot hour function. Okay, so we're looking at hour 13. That's fine. So let's say if now that hour equals 13, so 1 p.m. every day is when we send this out, then we do s.email. Okay. And then the last step of this would just be to run it every hour. And like I said, you can put this on any remote server at an interval. So the best way to do that is to just use a cron. And how you do that really depends on what operating system you're on. So if you're on Linux, if you're on Windows, it'll all be, it'll all be different. So I... I think I'm just not going to do it, but this is a good thing to learn if you haven't learned it. Maybe I'll do a video on that next, but this is all the code that will actually do this for you. So you just need to actually um, set it on a scheduler. Okay, guys, so that is um, that is all the code. So we got our last check mark here. Let's talk next steps because I think this would be actually a really good thing to turn in to a personal project if you're looking for ideas because you can change it a little bit and do a ton of different things. And for this specific app, um, I would say like, if you just, you could put in multiple sources. So source, 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 and then you could feed them all into the digest. And it would be, that would be pretty cool. Like you could even make a business out of that. You could, you could do, you could put together Google trends and you could put together all the, you could put this research digest together and build a huge mailing list. So I don't know, it's up to you. I'm not gonna come up with all the ideas for you, but. <laughs> If you do come up with a cool idea, and especially if you build it, uh, let me know, leave a comment or send me a message, whatever. All right, guys, that's all I got for this one. If you're at the level where you understood this video, I think you'd be a great fit for my algorithms course. Even if you already know some algorithms or um, you don't feel ready, I would encourage you to check it out because we, we have even a 30 day refund policy if you don't love it. I worked super hard on it. So I really appreciate if you at least looked into it, uh, interviewespresso.com if you haven't already checked it out. Otherwise, I will upload this code, but I'm not going to keep it maintained. So get it while it's hot. Because the point of this video is like how you do it and not 
exactly how it works. You shouldn't just be able to, you shouldn't just be copying it anyway. Let's put it that way. Other than that, that's all I got. I will catch you guys soon. A lot more videos on the way. Be sure to subscribe if you're not subscribed. And that's it. Like the video if you like this kind of video. Catch you guys soon.